Okay, so let's start in time, amazingly. Um, so for the, this afternoon session, we have a second keynote lecture given by Steve Tobias. Um, so Steve, uh, please go ahead. And, and just, uh, just after the talk, we will have the posters presentation, which are very brief, just an outline to give everybody the envy to come and see the poster. And those of you that are presenting posters and have not yet sent me their slide, please do so by email so that uh, we don't waste time changing the computers. Steve, please. Okay, Th thank you, Emmanuel. Can everybody hear? Is this on? Okay. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about um, yeah. Today I'm going to be talking about uh, solar and stellar magnetic fields, and in particular in their relation to dynamical systems and reduced models. And uh, if I have time, I'll talk a little bit about using data as well. So we heard this morning uh, that is a very serendipitous. Uh, time. So this is now 30 years since the, the uh, I guess, quite famous Newton Institute program on dynamo theory, which took place in 1992. You can see here uh, two books of which came out of it, uh, one of which uh, I will be taking an example from a bit later on. Uh, some of, you can have a look yourself at some of the uh, very famous uh, participants who were taking place, some of whom are unfortunately no longer with us. Uh, but many of many of them are. Um, so it's nice to see uh, uh, dynamo theory back in the Newton Institute, I think it's fair to say. So the theme of the talk is do exactly what Emmanuel tells you you must do. So that's, that's a good rule for life. So Emmanuel in an email said, we thought it would be great if you could cover solar and stellar fields and the connection with dy dynamical systems. That's a fairly tall order, but I'll, I'll do what I can. Uh, so let's see how we go. Oh, before I start, pretty much everything I say today is going to be included in one of these either reviews, recent reviews, or books. Uh, so we've already had the advert for uh, Keith and Emmanuel's book, which I, I think they'll be signing later on in the week. Uh, they don't charge too much for their signature. But then there's some very nice uh, reviews, um, on partic particularly on, on the, well, essentially Matt should have given this talk instead of me, but it's too modest. So. Uh, so this, this is very nice on the solar stellar connection and, and dynamo action. Then there's a nice set of notes by uh, Francois Rancon uh, in Journal of Plasma Physics. And then there's, a, there's also a JFM perspective uh, written by me, which has the advantage that it's free to download. So that's definitely worth every penny. Okay, so this is just an outline of the talk and I'm definitely gonna get through this bit. OK, and I may or may not get get through some of this bit. Uh, some of this bit doesn't really refer to uh, solar type dynamos. It may refer to some rapidly rotating stellar type dynamos, but it, it, it's a relevance to those of you who are studying planetary dynamos or um, the Earth's dynamo. So I'm going to start off by uh, showing some observations and just saying, what are we trying to describe or explain? And then I'll talk a little bit about uh, dynamical systems and reduced models uh, and talk about what can they explain and what can't they explain. They obviously can't explain everything. We heard from Keith this morning some amazing uh, uh, mathematics to do with how do you generate a large scale field in the first place. Uh, I don't think reduced models can say very much about that, but they can say something about the dynamics of that field once it's been generated. Uh, I'll talk. I'll have to introduce the concept of essentially kinematic and essentially nonlinear dynamos. I think probably Keith was talking mainly about what we call essentially kinematic dynamos, and essentially nonlinear dynamos are dynamos that may be driven by a finite amplitude magnetic field. So there may be a finite amplitude magnetic field that goes unstable, and that instability leads to an EMF, which is is capable of driving the dynamo cycle. And you'll hear a bit more about these kind of essentially nonlinear dynamos in Florence Marcotte's talk on, I think it's on Wednesday. Okay. So what are we all trying to explain? Well, there's actually a, a very beautiful recent paper uh, by these guys where they, they talk about observations of the solar magnetic field. And I always used to uh, present Galileo, but I think it's fair that Hevelius gets a, an outing every so often. So these are Hevelius's sunspot drawings. Uh, taken it uh, drawn in 1644 and you can see the well-known uh, magnetic fields uh, that you find in sunspots which tend to occur in pairs uh, these magnetic fields are we believe uh, generated deep within the sun 
Uh, this is a more modern observation, of course. Uh, this one's from 2014. Uh, and so nowadays, of course, we can measure the magnetic field in sunspots. And we know that they're uh, bipolar active regions. So one is a largely northern uh, uh, magnetic field, northern pole, north pole, and the, the other is, is south pole. Okay, and it's the dynamics, the large scale systematic dynamics of this kind of magnetic feature that we're trying to explain. Where do they come from and why do they have such systematic properties, given that the sun is a very turbulent environment? So again, in the same paper, you very rarely get to see the solar cycle kind of uh, across. Usually we just show little bits of it, right? But this is going back to 1600, all the way to uh, modern observations. And you can see that the sun, here's the 11 year solar cycle. Okay, it's modulated on a longer time scale. Uh, we have the 17th century, where there's very few sunspots, uh, so-called more the minimum. Some other interesting things to note from this is that the sun's magnetic field, although you can't tell from this, it's, these things look largely symmetric about the equator. Uh, the polarity in the north is opposite to the polarity in the south. So this is a signature of an underlying dipolar magnetic field. And you, you can really see um, <clears throat> that the magnetic field, at least for probably since, since about here, has been pretty much largely dipolar. Interestingly enough, uh, earlier on, uh, this isn't true. So here and here, you see some spots at the equator and so this is a signature of a quadrupole component in the, in the sun's magnetic field. So for those people who are trying to construct uh, dynamical systems models or low order models, you might be interested in the interaction of modes with different symmetries, uh, say a dipole or quadrupole mode. And that is particularly striking here when the sun emerged from the Maunder minimum when the sun emerged from the Maunder minimum, there were only sunspots in the southern hemisphere of the sun. And so what this is telling you is that essentially the quadrupole component is presumably about as large as the dipole component when you're just getting going. Okay, when you're emerging from a minimum, the, uh, uh, the uh, quadrupole and dipole grow together until essentially one of them gets established. And at the moment, I think the dipole is pretty well established. <clears throat> You can, you can quantify this by measuring what they call the, the, the motion of the magnetic equator. You can kind of see, if you like, it moving around. It's modulated. It's modulated on a longer time scale. Perhaps um, you see a modulation of about 80 to 90 years in, in the uh, magnetic equator. Some, sometimes that's called the Gleisberg cycle. Okay, it's, all, it's well known, especially here, that the, a sunspot is dark because it's the interaction of magnetic fields with convection. So here the magnetic field is, is inhibiting convection and that's why it appears dark on the surface of the sun. Okay, what else do we know <clears throat> about the sun? Well, we know, so, so we had data going back to essentially the invention of the telescope somewhere around about the start of the 17th century. We can get uh, more data going back uh, a lot further, uh, so-called proxy data of solar magnetic activity available. And this we get from uh, terrestrial isotopes, either beryllium-10 or carbon-14. So beryllium-10 is uh, stored in ice cores after two years in the atmosphere, and carbon-14 is stored in tree rings after 30 years. So you can't really see the 11-year cycle in carbon-14 because it gets washed out about with the time it's in the atmosphere. And the reason that these are anti-correlated, the production rate of these are anti-correlated with solar activity is because extra galactic cosmic rays get uh, uh, deflected by the uh, magnetic field. And so the more that they're deflected, the lower the production rate of these terrestrial isotopes. So the data seems to show that these grand minima, they're kind of, work, they're, they're kind of recurrent. So the Maunder minimum that you see is not the only minimum in the record. Uh, there are many uh, minima going back. These are maxima of beryllium 10 production. Well, it's, it's a bit dubious as to whether you say this is 208 years or 250 years, but there does seem to be a significant a period, a well-defined period associated with the uh, grand minima uh, when, when they occur. The solar cycle, you can actually see, does persist through the Maunder minimum. 
Uh, so that's a kind of signature that even though we couldn't see sunspots at the, at the surface, um, we, you know, a dynamo may be going on uh, deeper within the sun. So the sun's magnetic field may be globally changing, but perhaps the magnetic field wasn't strong enough to go unstable to form sunspots. Well, what is certainly true is that the uh, solar cycle is modulated. The 11 year solar cycle is modulated. Um, uh, there's, there's certainly some debate about whether it's chaotic modulation or stochastic modulation. Interestingly enough, there is this uh, supermodulation, which is uh, evident in the record, where minima appear in clusters. So you get a long period of time where there are no minima, and then you get a period of time where there are uh, lots of minima. And this is, is it, there's a kind of flipping or transition between two different states, kind of a bit like uh, what Andy was talking about this morning with a weak field and strong field dynamo. There are two states and you seem to be able to flip between the two, which I think is an interesting phenomena and it'd be interesting to know a lot more about them. Okay, well, we're not going to know about anything about the sun without looking at other, other stars to see what the magnetic field in other stars are like. So these are shamelessly stolen from Matt's uh, review. So I do recommend you, you read Matt's review with uh, Sasha Brown. Uh, so it's well known that if you look at solar type stars, that magnetic activity increases with rotation rate. Okay, so this is the Rossby number against the amplitude of the, the field. And there's a well-defined trend here. Now the sun has an 11 year period. What also happens to the period of uh, activity as you change the rotation rate? So again, you can uh, have a look at solar type stars. And this is a bit more complicated and I'm, I'm, not, I'm honestly not quite certain what the latest status of this is, but at least a, a few years ago, there was the, the idea that there were two branches. There was an active branch and an inactive branch with a different behavior of the cycle period with the rotation period, both of which show an increase of cycle period with the rotation period. Okay, so, so if we have a dynamo theory, whatever it is, we'd like it to be able to explain not just the sun, but we'd like it to be able to explain all these observations as well. What else would we like it to explain? Well, if you take solar type stars, there's a wide variety of the temporal behavior, temporal large scale activity. And so you can see here, let's see if I can find them, there are, there are stars which are, seem to be largely periodic, okay? This is the sun, if you viewed the sun as a star, this is the calcium H and K emission, uh, which is you know, nicely periodic. There are some which are kind of flat, although you might be able to see a, a period in here. There are some which are interpreted as going into or coming out of a more than minimum. This, is, this one is sometimes, uh, uh, attributed to being going into a more than minimum. But what seems to be interesting is that there's a variety of behavior and you find periodic, quasi-periodic and chaotic type dynamics. And so that's interesting as well. Those people who do nonlinear dynamics will think about this as being a bifurcation sequence, sort of a ruel tarkin's route to chaos. Uh, but uh, at least we have some nonlinear PDEs. Uh, nonlinear PDEs are well known for showing these kinds of transitions as you change a parameter. Okay, so finally, um, for the observational bit, um, so there are young rapid rotators. So rapid rotators, the sun is a moderate rotator. It rotates around once a month, give or take. Uh, a convective time scale is roughly uh, one month, give or take. So, so a typical Rossby number would be about one. There's lots of arguments about whether it's 0.1 or one, but it's not 10 to the minus five, we think. However, there are stars which spin a lot faster than the sun, and they are presumably a small Rossby number. So rapid rotators tend to have strong polar spots. So this is an observation, okay? And very rapid rotation, I would say makes these dynamos more like the geodynamo, right? So maybe there's examples of strong field dynamos. Here's a recent uh, calculation, simulation of a rapidly rotating star. And you can see, well, at least some things are aligning with the uh, rotation axis and we have strong polar spots, which are formed. So perhaps these, these ones are kind of more like the, the geodynamo type uh, system. Okay, so that's the uh, 
introduction, a whistle stop tour. Um, so now I was asked to talk about uh, dynamical systems and reduced models. So let me just spend a bit of time saying what I think these are good for. So imagine we take our solar and stellar dynamos. There, I think there are two questions you could ask. Well, there's at least two questions. So the first question you could ask is, how can you generate a large scale field at, that should say, high RM in a turbulent environment? Okay, and that really was the topic of Keith's talk this morning. He's like, where, where does this large scale mode come from? Given we have all this turbulence, we're exceptionally high RM. How, how do we get a large scale field in the first place? And, and that is a, is a, I think it's still a contentious issue. And because it's a contentious issue, and Emmanuel didn't ask me to talk about it, which is great, I'm not going to. I'll just say a couple of things. But you could ask, okay, I don't know how, but I've got a large scale mode. What are the dynamics and interactions of this large scale mode? What do we expect it to do once it's there? And it's these things, you know, do we expect it to be modulated? Do we expect interactions of things with different symmetries? That kind of thing. It's that kind of thing that I believe reduced models are, are useful for. So just very briefly, to answer question one, well, as I said, Keith covered most of this, you could use a statistical theory. These really, you need some kind of statistical theory because you're talking about large scales or spatio-temporally uh, coherent magnetic fields. And so you're going to want to do some averaging. And as soon as you start talking about averaging, you start to do things like uh, mean field theory or renormalization group dynamics or stuff like this. It all gets very technical very quickly, but this is what you, what you tend to do. You tend to do mean field electrodynamics, have a look in uh, Keith and Emmanuel's books. Uh, you use one of these turbulence theories. Uh, perhaps the simplest one you could use is first order smoothing or a so-called quasi-linear approximation. You could be a bit more sophisticated than that and then use one of these two uh, uh, turbulence theories, the so-called eddy damp quasi-normal Markovian approximation or minimal tau, which is a variation of that approximation. If you're feeling incredibly energetic, you could do what's called two-scale direct interaction approximation calculations. Uh, these are really technically challenging to do, but there's a beautiful review by Nobumitsu Yokoi uh, on this. And I think Nobumitsu is coming later on in the, in the program. So if you want to know anything about this approach, you should ask him. You could, instead of doing statistical theories, try and simulate the statistics. So self-consistently track mean fields and low order statistics. And that's a whole other talk. Those of you who are going to Leeds can hear uh, my postdoc talk about this um, if you're interested. But I'm not gonna talk about this. So let's go move on to uh, what are the dynamics and interactions of the large scale mode, which is the, the second question I ask. So we could use uh, dynamical systems theory, and there are various different things we can use uh, from dynamical systems theory to shed light on the, on the problem. Uh, we could use uh, normal form theory. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, but essentially normal form theory uh, relies on you being essentially close to a set of bifurcations that you know are gonna happen, and then doing a so-called unfolding of the bifurcation such that your uh, equations that you derive are robust. Usually if you do that, uh, you're, you're relying on some of the symmetries. You tend to rely on the symmetries of the underlying, underlying equations or magnetic field. Um, it, this is, I think, an interesting one, which is kind of laying dormant for about 20 years. Uh, the, um, the equations that we're solving are, are very non-normal, non-self-adjoint. And the concept of convective and absolute instability, which comes from fluid dynamics and uh, dynamical systems theory, I, I, I believe does play a role in the transition, but I'm not really gonna say too much about that. We have lots of theory. I'm not saying theory is a bad thing. Theory is obviously a good thing. I'm studying the Newton Institute here, <laughs> but we also have lots of data. We have data from observations. We have data from numerical simulations. And I think time is right for us to use some of that data to try and understand mathematical structures and to uh, generate um, reduced equation sets. So if I get a time, I'll, if I get time, I'll talk about some of these approaches, not for problems uh, related to the uh, solar magnetic field, but more for problems related to rapidly rotating stars or, or perhaps the dynamo problem. So we'll, we'll see what we can see there. 
Okay, why is that not moving anymore? Before I go on, I want to try and distinguish between what I call essentially kinematic and essentially nonlinear dynamos. So let's think about what I mean by essentially kinematic dynamo. And this is one, as its name implies, that can be investigated almost completely through kinematic theory. The, the, the kind of nonlinear saturation, although very contentious, the level at which it saturates, uh, is kind of bolted on to the theory. So for this theory, for these types of dynamos, what you conceptually think of is you have some hydrodynamic turbulence, you have, um, I don't know, rapidly rotating convection or, or even moderately rotating convection. And this gives you a U prime, okay? This gives you a, fluct a turbulent fluctuating velocity. And then that ball of, of turbulence, hydrodynamic turbulence goes unstable to a dynamo instability. Uh, and, you know, you get an exponentially growing or on average exponentially growing magnetic field from an arbitrarily weak field, uh, B prime, and then you saturate in an MHD turbulent state. And, and, and Keith showed some examples this morning about these of these essentially kinematic dynamo instability. And he was talking about the different timescales upon which the small scale field and the large scale field might be generated and might saturate. So we're all aware of these essentially kinematic dynamos. They, you know, for, for example, convective dynamos, perhaps with no rotation or dynamos where the turbulence is driven by some hydrodynamic instability. You then add a magnetic field, the turbulence generates a magnetic field, everything saturates. Mechanically forced dynamos are usually of this form or perhaps small scale stellar dynamos of the type, the convective type that you see in the outer layers of the sun. Now, I'm not saying there are no prob problems with, uh, with these, there are. The, the issues with these is this issue that Keith alluded to about the electromotive force. The electromotive force is U prime cross B prime averaged. So imagine now U prime is coming from this turbulence Okay, this hydrodynamic turbulence, and B prime is now coming from your solution of the induction equation at high RM. It's very hard to correlate U prime and B prime when you average it such that you get a significant mean. And this comes back to uh, the, the picture Keith drew earlier of the, of the um, cyclonic events. It's how do you know you just go around once? As opposed, or half a pit, half a time, as opposed to once or three over two times. In certain limits, you can make U prime correlate with B prime, for example, at small RM or at short correlation time. But in general, it's very hard to do. Correlations may be re-established non-linearly, perhaps. So everything sorts itself out here, or perhaps omically as well on an omic time scale. And uh, you know you may get this large, very slow growth of the large scale field. Okay. What's an essentially uh, non-linear dynamo? Well, okay, so imagine now we have our hydrodynamic turbulence, or even just laminar flow or no flow, and then you add in a finite amplitude magnetic field. Okay, so we're not sustaining, we're not generating the magnetic field from essentially zero or arbitrarily small magnetic field, we put in a finite amplitude magnetic field, and that finite amplitude magnetic field could lead to a, some kind of more efficient turbulence, perhaps by providing instabilities of the field. So if we have an instability of the field, so maybe the magnetic buoyancy or the MRI, or perhaps current driven instabilities or joint instabilities, there's a lot of things we could think about, then uh, one might get a more efficient uh, generation of an EMF, because if you go back and you think about it, if we're interested in correlations between U prime and B prime, it'd be nice if both B prime and U prime were driven by the same instability. If they're driven by the same instability, then they may correlate a bit better. They may not, but at least there's a hope that they are. Um, another example of an essentially nonlinear dynamo is one where you, the magnetic field, the finite amplitude, uh, act so as to uh, relax the, uh, some constraints of the turbulence. So called maybe rapid rotation. Uh, so you might, uh, uh, as we saw this morning, actually, a, a, fine, a, a strong enough magnetic field could lead to transiting to uh, a strong field branch, right? From, and that's a more efficient uh, uh, 
uh, mode of uh, dynamo action. So I've put here some essentially nonlinear dynamos, um, ones driven by instabilities, uh, some uh, references here in, in disks, uh, some uh, magnetic buoyancy driven dynamos uh, uh, by Nick Brummel and collaborators. Uh, then there's uh, some so called Taylor sprout dynamos that happen in radiative interiors. And I'm sure Florence is going to say something about those on Wednesday. And the ones you all know of breaking constraints, uh, the strong field branch of the geodynamo. Okay. So, what would you do to generate a reduced model in these two different dynamo regimes? Well, if we're essentially kinematic, uh, well, it might be a bit easier because. We're somehow near to the dynamo instability, or we could be. We could fix parameters such that we're near to the dynamo instability. And we could use maybe some truncation in orthonormal modes. It's something we've all done. We've all seen the derivation of the Lorenz equations or another typo uh, by a Galerkin truncation, okay, for convection. So it's well known that close to a bifurcation, you can do a, a lower, you can get a low order model by uh, just truncating your system and looking at the ordinary differential equations that you, you would get from the partial differential equations. Okay, you could, okay, it's well known that as a, as a description of the true PDEs, that becomes increasingly inaccurate as you get more nonlinear. I mean, the Lorenz equations go chaotic way before two-dimensional uh, convection does, for example. <clears throat> so that's something you could, you could look at. Um, there are other things you could do. You could use the symmetries. For example, if you're solving some kind of uh, system in a sphere, you know that there's certain symmetries that the sphere has. So you use these symmetries and normal form theory to derive equation sets uh, that are valid near the bifurcations. And, and uh, there was, in the, in the, in the late 90s, uh, Edgar Knobloch and collaborators uh, had a lot of uh, joy in trying to understand modulation of the solar cycle by essentially looking at the interaction of dipole and quadrupole modes. These are just modes uh, of, of different symmetries. Okay. But it's not clear to me what you would do for these essentially nonlinear dynamos. What, what do you do? Because you know, you know you're not really very close to anything. Uh, you can still use the symmetries though. I think we can still use the symmetries and we, we should appeal to data, I think, to try and get our our low order models. Okay. I'm just going to say one thing about this is not my job. So I'm going to say one thing about the Earth, or two things about the Earth. The Earth, we all know the magnetic field reverses. So there are these reversals. Uh, the Earth's magnetic field is presently predominantly dipolar, uh, but we get all these reversals. Okay. So this is really the dipole uh, flipping. Okay. But we also know that there are these things called excursions where it's, it's kind of like a failed reversal. And this is gonna be, uh, well, I guess important a bit later on. So, you know, we're primarily up here and then the, uh, the Earth's magnetic pole wanders. If it wanders 45 degrees or more from its rotational pole, apparently it's called a, a geometric, geomagnetic excursion. And I don't know whether this is, this is the case or not, but they're generally attributed to reversal of the polarity of the Earth's liquid outer core. So you manage to reverse the uh, magnetic field in the liquid outer core, but you don't quite manage to reverse it in the solid uh, inner core. So you, you kind of try and have a reversal and then you go back. Okay. Okay, so, so just bear in mind that these things happen. We have reversals and we have excursions. Okay, so just on the on the last uh, thing I want to say is a kind of introduction. Uh, this is taken from uh, the book, the famous book, um, and so this is an example of an of an essentially nonlinear dynamo. It's the famous uh, representation originally done by Paul Roberts, where. Uh, the the uh, geodynamo has these two branches, and we saw them this morning uh, in Andy. There's a weak field branch, and this is the essentially kinematic bit. And then there's a strong field branch up here, and up here is because the magnetic field has become strong enough to affect 
the convection in a, in a significant way, change the balance, and then that releases the, uh, the potential to have a more efficient um, strong field branch. And what we saw this morning was that um, uh, Andy had some things where it was kind of bouncing along, bouncing along, bouncing along, bouncing along. And then he was a bit upset because then all of a sudden it went to the strong field branch and he's like, oh no, okay, we have to integrate for, for a long time just to figure out whether we're going to get, go here or here. Okay. And my feeling is that, you know, he wasn't even at that lower Ekman number. So, you know, the, 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 the smaller, you, the more rapidly you rotate it, the worse this problem is going to get. Okay. So when you're thinking about these things from a, a dynamical systems point of view, uh, you tend to think about this. Uh, and this, this all comes from the language of transition to turbulence, which is why there was a picture of somebody with pipe flow on the front of my talk, okay? So, uh, so let me uh, just explain what we're talking about here. Down here, okay, this is, this is the zero magnetic field down here. And over here, we may have a weak field dynamo, or in certain cases, we might have no dynamo. If I go back here, if we're over here, we have no dynamo at all. And then, but we may still be able to get to the strong field branch if we can get ourselves over here and then go to there. So we either have a weak field dynamo or, or no dynamo. And then there will be a perturbation, not a linear perturbation, a nonlinear perturbation, which takes you uh, from uh, the weak field dynamo branch to the strong field dynamo branch. So, and then there will be a perturbation with the minimal amount of energy that gets you from there to there. And this is sometimes called the minimal seed, okay? So what you could have is you could have, you know, one of these weak field dynamos, as, as we saw this morning, you could bounce along, bounce along, bounce along, and then the fluctuation may take you to here, and then you'd go to the strong field dynamo, okay? So as I said, this is very reminiscent of what is, what is seen in, in uh, wall-bounded shear flows, where we have a laminar state, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about this a bit later on. Uh, we have a laminar state, uh, which is usually, or it's usually uh, stable to uh, linear perturbations. And then if you give it a finite amplitude kick, you will go from here to here. Okay, and then there's a lot of work been done in, uh, in finding these minimal seeds. And uh, I'm sure Florence is going to talk about that on Wednesday. Right? How do you find these minimal seeds? Um, and she's going to talk about it for dynamos, which is really exciting. Okay, so when I'm talking about wall bounded shear flows, you've all seen this picture. We have laminar flow. Okay, you give it a big kick. Uh, if you give it a big kick, you can transit to turbulent flow. Um, and this goes back, uh, you know, a long way. So we'd be mad if we're trying to uh, uh, describe transitions between weak field branches and, and strong uh, field branches if we didn't uh, talk a little bit about or use some of the language or use some examples from wall bounded shear flows. So these are the uh, canonical uh, subcritical transitional flows. Um, so there's uh, plane couette flow, pipe flow, and plane place flow. Uh, you can see that these two, they're linearly stable for all Reynolds numbers. Plane place flow does go unstable somewhere up here, but it goes unstable at a Reynolds number way bigger than, than the Reynolds numbers you, uh, you find uh, turbulence at. And so it's a massively subcritical uh, bifurcation. Okay, and so the question you might ask is, okay, so here we have a laminar state and a turbulent state. If you're bouncing along here, if you're Andy and you're doing your calculation, if you're bouncing along here, uh, how can you tell that you might go to there? Or if you're bouncing along there, how can you tell if you're gonna go to there? Okay, and I'm gonna argue that you can tell it from data. Okay, so, we're gonna do a model of plane couette flow. We're a long way from the solar dynamo at this point. It has to be said, we'll come back, don't worry. Okay, so model of plane couette flow. Uh, I'm sure you all know what plane couette flow is. So this is just flow between two walls, which are moving at different, uh, one's moving this way with uniform velocity, one's moving this way with uniform velocity. So our base state is a linear shear flow, okay. 
And what we're going to do is we're going to try and look at the uh, data from this. We're going to try and see if you're Andy, for example, doing his calculation, if you train what's called a reservoir computer on the bit of the time series where you have no indication whatsoever that it's going to go to the Strongfield branch, can one of these things predict that it will? And the answer is yes, it can, which is amazing. I mean, I, I still don't understand why it can, but it can. So let's, and it's all to do with excursions and reversals, I think. I'm not going to go into details about how we do this, uh, um, these uh, echo state networks. I just want to say that these are not um, recurrent neural nets. They're a very, very, very simple form of machine learning. They're not, most people who do machine learning wouldn't even think about these things as machine learning. But what you do is you have this uh, network of nodes and you just randomly wire them very sparsely. So there's no levels, there's only one level. You put an input. Okay, and then you have, uh, you have an input, you assign them to the nodes, and then you have a, a vector of weights, which gives you the output. Okay, and the only thing, so it, when you're doing machine learning, you change all of these things, we're gonna fix these, and we're just gonna change these, okay? And can this uh, do some prediction? And if it can, this is telling us something about the, un the underlying state. So, okay, I haven't said very much. Uh, because we're only changing, didn't work if you point it away. Because we're only changing this bit here, it turns out that you can do an optimization just by a linear, uh, uh, linear least squares fitting, essentially. So this is very quick, very easy to do. Um, so as I've said here, you do a minimization of this residual sum of squares. So you know, at each at each uh, step, you have this training data. You say, um, how well can can I um, can I uh, minimize the the least squares fit between the training data and the real data? And uh, we do this by changing these outputs, these weights outputs, via what's called the normal equation. I'm not going to go into detail. And then we say, once we've trained the, new, the uh, reservoir, we say something like, okay, how well can that reservoir predict what's going on? Okay. And so this, this has been done for a while for these types of, they're called echo state networks, these reservoir computers. And it's been done on various different forms of dynamical system. So, you know, it's been done for all the canonical uh, famous uh, dynamical systems, it's been done for some PDEs, it's even been done for Rayleigh Bernard convection, uh, largely by Ed Ott and his collaborators. This is an example on the kuramoto sivashinsky equation, which shows that actually, if you train and train one of these things, it can predict a something with spatio-temporal complexity going for five Lyapunov times, which is amazing. You wouldn't have thought you could do anything like five Lyapunov times for, the, for a chaotic system. Uh, but when all said and done, it's been trained on a certain type of data, and we're just trying to predict the same type of data. We're just trying to predict the same thing. So you might think, well, okay, I can maybe just fit things such that it, it can do this. So we ask the question, can it predict dynamics or statistics it has never seen? Okay, so you train it on one type of dynamics, and you want to say, can I predict something different? Okay, so as I've said here, there are, there's a lot of mathematics which goes on behind these things. Uh, there's something called the echo state network approximation theorem, which uh, I can talk to anybody about afterwards, but we can expect one of these things to embed trajectories of the true system via this theorem. But what does that really mean? I mean, can it really predict things that it's never seen? Okay, so we're not going to do it for dynamos. We're not even going to do it for correct. <laughs> we're going to do it for a... A, a low order model of correct flow. Uh, and I'm not going to go into details. We have this thing, which is uh, we, what we do is we do a Galerkin truncation. Okay, we can derive this is work, so called MOLIS model. Um, so you, um, you get a nine dimensional system of ordinary differential equations, and then you can just go away and solve them. And what you find is that you have this uh, dynamics where you have uh, turbulence, okay? You're bouncing along, bouncing along, bouncing along. And then all of a sudden you transition to a laminar state. 
Okay. Change the Reynolds number, bounce along, bounce along, transition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. So the question we asked is: okay, imagine we have this. Can we predict that it's going to do this? And um, how much data do you need? And what do we mean by predict it's going to do this? Can we predict the time at which it does this? Or can we predict the probability that it's going to do this? You might want us to think about these things as excursions and this thing as a reversal. Okay, so, so for training, we consider only the turbulent trajectories without any laminarization events. So depending on our Reynolds number, we pick either this as our time series, this is our time series, whatever. Okay. And then we say to ourselves, what is, you know, what would it do if we try and predict what's going to happen? And this is, uh, no, that's not what happens. That, that's that's what, what was going to happen. That is what really happens, okay? Okay, I'm not going to talk about uh, short-term prediction. Let me show you this long-term prediction. So uh, the, the orangey, the dark orange one is the real system, okay? That's the real system. And this is, we train, say, up to here, and then we run our echo state network in prediction mode and we get it coming up to here. So it's predicted a transition, which is amazing. Uh, although of course it's, it has no information about what this state should look like. It knows it should go to a state, but it has no information about what that state looks like. So it gets it wrong, which is perhaps unsurprising. So what might you want to know? You might want to know you might want to know what is the probability, what is the lifetime of this? So this, you might think, what is the lifetime between a reversal? For example, if you're doing a geodynamo, what is the lifetime of this? Okay, and so you could plot a, uh, uh, a, a, a lifetime function. Um, so this is the probability of lasting a time t, okay? And okay, so the, see if I can get this wrong and right. The light, the darker ones are the truth. The lighter ones are the um, are the are the echo state network predictions. And you can see it gets the lifetime of the turbulence uh, pretty well, pretty well. Except for here, okay, this is at low Reynolds number, uh, and we don't have long. This one goes uh, lamina straight away, and so we don't have long enough uh, time series for training. And here, and this is a very high Reynolds number where the distribution has changed and we, we, uh, we just can't find uh, the distribution for, um, uh, for the echo state network. Okay, let me, and then the second thing you might want to know is, can you predict the time at which a reversal is going to uh, occur? So if you're bouncing along here, is this gonna be a reversal? Or is this going to be a reversal, et cetera, giving you a different length of training? And then you can work out the probability of one of these things getting it right. And if you can get this to work, which we finally managed to do, you could perhaps use these things as early warning systems that we're going to transition, say, from the weak field branch to the strong field branch. So, okay, I have, how, how long do I have, Emmanuel? Okay, so what are we going to try on next? Well, we're going to try on something to do with solar dynamos. So this is uh, a solar dynamo series where, um, well, it's not a solar dynamo, it's an it's a anelastic convection dynamo, fully three-dimensional, which has these amazing dynamics. And the question there is, can uh, echo state networks predict, uh, get these periods of reduced activity, which are similar to the more than the minimum, if you just train them on the bit where they're working? Uh, where the dynamo is working normally. So that's something to think about. So I'm going to finish by saying something about, that I think actually um, Andy alluded to as well. And I think this is a really interesting thing to think about. Um, so here's a question. What if we have an easy to integrate problem and a hard to integrate one? So one could be fully, fully uh, three-dimensional uh, convection in a sphere at Ekman number 10 to the minus four. Now, most people would go away and integrate that and, and get a very long time series that they, they're very happy with. Uh, they may even get lots of reversals, who knows? They, they, they may uh, 
find out quite a lot about the structure of rotating convection at that Ekman number. But then you might say, okay, I want to know something about the dynamics of Ekman number 10 to the minus 10. Well, we can't do that. I mean, maybe 10 to the minus eight, we can integrate for a very, very short time. I don't know. Nat Schaefer seems to be able to manage to do that. So let's imagine that you can do that for a very short time. So can you say anything? So if we have a large data set, say done by our dynamo calculation at Ekman number 10 to the minus four, and a small data set, say we managed to do something at much higher resolution, which I think Andy was doing this morning, uh, he had little bits. Can we say anything about the statistics of the hard problem from the statistics of the easy problem, plus a little bit of training on the hard problem? And the answer seems to lie in this thing called transfer learning. So what you do is you take your matrix, your matrix of weights. This is from your easy problem, okay? And this one is calculated by training a little bit. I'm not going to go into details on the hard problem. Okay. So you take a long, long time series of the easy problem and a short time series of the hard problem, and you somehow bolt them together. Keep doing that. Uh, so we tried this on, do you recognize this key? We tried this on, on, on this on this model, which comes from this book. And this book is the thing, the book that emerged a year later from the Dynamo Theory Program. Uh, so this is, this is the famous Chewy Moffat Dynamo, which I think essentially only I ever refer to, but I refer to it a lot, so that's good. Um, and what they did there was they coupled uh, the lambda loop. So this is a model of convection, simple model of convection with two Bullard disk dynamos here. Yeah? And they derived a system of ordinary differential equations. Okay. And those of you who are very much awake will, will notice that there's, there's an, uh, subsets of this uh, system, which are like the Lorenz equations. Um, but I'm not going to go into too much detail. And so this is the bifurcation structure as you change this parameter psi. Again, this is from Keith and Atta's paper. So you, uh, as you increase psi, you get this sequence of bifurcations, you get all these nice gluing bifurcations and you get this very complicated behavior. So the question you could ask is, if I have a long time series where it's doing something over here and a short time series where it's doing something over here, can I predict the statistics of what's going on over here? And the answer is maybe. We're still working on this, I keep doing that. Okay, so as I've said, the idea is to add in a little bit of data from a hard problem to the training. So here are just two examples. And in these kinds of systems, it's nice to plot the, uh, the, the i-th maximum of some variable against the i plus first uh, variable. And uh, for this one, the echo state network was trained at uh, a very chaotic uh, point, And we tried to do predictions at something that was slightly less chaotic. And we seem to do pretty well. Or you could try and train it at a very laminar or uh, uh, simple time dependence uh, type behavior and try and predict it as something that was a lot more chaotic. And again, with a following wind, you can do quite well. So this is something we're, we're definitely thinking about. And it'd be interesting to talk to people who, who have this problem to see if we could do something with their, with their data. Okay, so now I'm going to finish. So I'm not going to say anything about sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics, and that's what Emmanuel asked me to talk about. So, you know, who cares? So let me go way past there. Apologies. I'll go straight to my conclusions. Okay, so my conclusions are in two parts. So solar and stellar dynamo theory can really be split into two parts. The first is how do you get a large scale mode in a turbulent system at high RM? And that's what Keith talked about this morning. And then the second thing is what are the important nonlinear interactions of a large scale mode once it is generated? Okay. And, the, and I also hope to get across to you that dynamos can be essentially kinematic or essentially nonlinear. Uh, my uh, conclusions too is that you're never going to have a substitute for understanding the physics or mathematics. I mean, this is vital. 
but it's clear that ignoring observations and data is ridiculous, no matter how much we mathematicians would like to do it. We shouldn't really be ignoring observations and data. And uh, just to say that echo state networks, they are capable of predicting dynamics they have never seen. And that from a dynamical systems point of view, this is because they've somehow learned something about the nature of the attractor. In the case I showed you, it learned the fact that it might transition from the fact that there were these bursts. And so you might be able to learn, in, say for the geodynamo, that it might reverse from the fact that there were these excursions. Okay, so if, you, if you've got a time series and there's lots of excursions, you might think, well, maybe there's a reversal coming along. Uh, Florence is gonna talk about this on Wednesday, so I won't say anything. And then I'll, I'll finish by saying there may be a way of getting the statistics, nothing more than the statistics of a hard to integrate problem by solving an easy one and using what's called transfer learning. Okay, I'll leave it there, thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. I think you did very well not to follow instruction for each of you. Um, questions? Yes, Uli. Yeah, um, coming back to the question predicting the next reversal of the geomagnetic field. So what you're seeing are the prospects if you have, uh, well, of course, look at data, for example, like data from Casey Constable that covers the last 100,000 years, with yeah. two or three, I don't know how many excursions happened. You think there's a really realistic chance to <laughs> okay. come to a robust <laughs> prediction? Okay, so, so the answer to that is I have absolutely no idea, but I think it's worth trying out on numerical models first. I mean, so, you know, you have, there's tons of people in this room with lots of numerical models. So we could just go away and try it. You know, if we, if we were just looking at this bit of your numerical model, could we predict that it was going to reverse at all? I mean, that'd be an interesting thing to do. I mean, uh, this exercise has been done for numerical simulations and the answer is no, we can't. So uh, say that again. We can't, we, we can't predict it. You can't? No, we can't. Um, Maybe that's a very short answer, but it depends on how far you weigh in time, basically, right? Ah, okay. So, um, okay. so there's there's two yeah, yeah there's two things you might want to predict. Is, of course, if the reversal has happen... already started, then there is a certain likelihood, right. and so forth. The, cl the right. closer you are, the higher the likelihood yeah. that it will come. But but the problem is, well, I I don't know whether you're interested in the distinction between excursions and reversals. As you said, they're basically the same thing. And our understanding in the moment is that you go into a different dynamo state and then it's just a matter of chance whether it goes back or, right. or ends up in the up, uh, opposite polarity, right? Yeah. So, but, so, and it's really a Poisson statistic. I think that's still our best model and understanding of this reversal. So one is independent from the next and so forth and you cannot really predict much. So ju just on the, on, the, um, on, the, on the question, there, there are two questions you might ask. One of which is, can you predict the time? at which there's going to be, is there going to be a reversal in the yeah. next? And then there's the, there's the, can you predict the statistics? So the statistics is, can you, from, from just training on a, can you say what the statistics for the lifetime of the reversals is going to be? And you're absolutely right. The first one is, in, is much, much more difficult than the second one. Yeah, I mean, okay. I mean, um, as long as we see re excursions, which are deep enough, let's say, right? Um, then, there is a high likelihood that an reversal may come at some point, but right. we don't know when. But you may be able to say, what is the probability? Not when it's going to come exactly, but you may say there's a probability. Even, even uh, this is very difficult. I know, um, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. It's so very I'm not sure but... we learn a lot. But actually, my, I had a question as well, and this was, you know, from this machine learning, I mean, it's, it's good to be able to predict something if it's possible at all, but was it, does it tell us about the physics of the system? Maybe your answer is nothing, right? Or I don't know. It's, it, well, it or, may or, or it, we it, don't know. <laughs> yeah, it may or it may not. So, so this, I think machine learning doesn't really tell you anything about the physics very much. The second bit of the talk, which I didn't say anything about, the Cindy, which is the identification of nonlinear dynamics, that will tell you about the important nonlinear interactions in your system. So I didn't talk about that, but machine learning really, do, you should just use it as a tool. I hate to say that any machine learning people would say, this is not machine learning what I'm doing. But you know, even that is, is, it's very hard to get physics from the system. You have a chance with this type of machine learning because you're solving a linear problem. And so you have a chance to really look at the dynamical system 
that is not usually the case in, in machine learning because it's, it's so highly nonlinear, but this is just a least squares, essentially a fancy least squares fit. And so there is the hope, but I would say, no, no, if you wanna know about the physics, do, do the other thing. Yeah, so I think this is an interesting experiment. And uh, Kyle Gertz, who's uh, now at NASA, has done some experiments looking at uh, some of um, Alex Fournier and Matt Schaefer's uh, very long-term dynamo simulations, trying to see if they can predict an interval within which a reversal might occur based on okay. just on axial dipole moment variations. Okay. Um, this actually prompted a question and, and, and it wasn't successful when transferred to the paleo field observations yeah. um, because the quality of those observations doesn't have enough temporal resolution, I believe. Yeah. But I think a question I have for you is, um, do you have to have a chaotic attractor in here? Because one of this, these things that this led us to ask was whether the Schaefer simulation was actually chaotic or whether it was more like a stochastic AR process okay. in its product. Okay, so th these things, if you, if you add, uh, so if you add stochastic terms to this, which you can do quite easily, then it becomes much harder to, to predict. So you can, if it's purely chaotic, then you have a chance, then, then you have to say, you know, how much is, is due to chaos and how much is due to stochastic perturbations to that. If you, if you believe it, it's a purely stochastic process, uh, which I don't, I mean, you're solving PDEs. I mean, you know, these things are, I mean, you might want to model your unresolved terms by uh, stochastic noise, but it's still really a deterministic process. Then, so if, if you really believe it is a stochastic process, then, then you wouldn't be able to do it using this. Well, then the question, next question would be how many of our numerical simulations are mainly stochastic processes versus um, chaotic processes? Well, they're all, they're all deterministic, I would argue. But you can model a deterministic mm. process using mm. that. You, you can, you can, but when all said and done, they are all deterministic. I don't know of anybody who adds noise. Yeah. Yeah, certain aspects you can model stochastic. Yeah, we've recently been looking at the issue of taking a long time series from a numerical dynamo model and using machine learning. And we find that um, reversals can be predicted with a reasonable okay. level of skill. Um, but that's after training the model on a very long time series. And I would agree with Kathy that in paleomagnetism, we don't have that resolution for a sufficiently long time period to be able to say whether the field is going to reverse. Um, unfortunately, that work hasn't been written up. The student who was doing it, um, somebody in machine learning at Amazon Research in the other Cambridge learned about it and she got uh, poached away. Oh, right. Okay. That's the... So I, I should say, I mean, although I pretty presented all this for the geodynamo i'm really interested in when when is the next more the minimum going to come and you know that is an interesting question in itself and so i think of, of course you know certain dynamo problems have certain structures but sorry yeah unfortunately it's already been 300 years since the last one so yeah yeah i have a few questions so, okay so, so they all basically come down to your claims that the system is not stochastic but, but th this is certainly true, except you're comparing it against a low order system. So if you want to argue the numerical solution is not stochastic, then you have to have a system with millions of degrees of freedom. Yeah. And, if, and you cannot reduce that to a low order system without having some stochastic system. If you want to model is... the system with you know, a million degrees, it's quite possible you can only do that in a low order if you have stochastic fluctuations. What is true though, is that the sun is dominated by these large scale modes. The solar magnetic field is dominated by a yes. dipole and a quadrupole and, and mode. The question is, is noise in the- in Absolutely. The CE, is it a stochastic noise or is it chaotic? And I would argue because I have that it's stochastic. Um, yeah. And, and my second point goes back to your stars. So you say for the stars, you have um, periodic solutions, quasi-periodic solutions, and then chaotic. Yeah. But we cannot tell really if the sun is 
and we've got 300 years of data. I'm surprised you can make such statement for the stars. Oh, no. You, well, okay. So I, I was very careful to say lots of people attribute these are periodic. This one looks like it's going into a minimum, but they only have 30, 40 years of worth of data. So I would not, you know, put my house on the fact that these are chaotic. However, the sun, you know, we have long enough, we have a brilliant 10 day to go back 20,000 years. For the new blue, and for us, um, we haven't been anything inconsistent with noise on top of the um, basic lesson. Okay, I mean, but, you know, there's nothing inconsistent with it being uh, chaos, right? There's nothing inconsistent. Okay, I, 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 will, I will definitely, in fact, that's what I, I said on my slide. I'll, I'll get, you know, it could be stochastic modulation. It could be chaotic modulation. You say the 200 year, 208 year period, maybe 210 is significant, but I've looked and I don't, I mean, I get the same type of behavior with noise. I've looked at, you can look at what each of the periodicities which pop up. Okay, what I said was the 208 year period seems to come out of the data. I'm not saying it's, it's significant for, you know, that is a period in the chaotic, system but there is, there is a peer, well defined period in the data of 200 and something years that it could it could be it could be a stochastic modulation absolutely there is no urgent pressing question i think we should send steve again thank you very much steve for the brilliant talk and we now have a um, very brief presentation of the posters um, in alphabetic order. I think Florentin Daniel is the first.